Hello, welcome back to Dinosaurs. We're going to keep running through module four here. And this is going to be the last week of module four, very short module here on the Ornithischian dinosaurs. We're going to have a module assessment at the end of this module, a short module assessment similar to the module one and module three assessments, which you probably just took the module three assessments. So it's going to be very similar to that. Module five is coming up next. It's going to be kind of a review, tying up some of the loose ends and looking at some of the more famous uh, dinosaur deposits. Uh, and then we're done. So we're getting up to the end here. I hope everyone's sticking with all their classes. I hope everyone's sticking on schedule. And uh, I hope everyone's looking forward to summer because I know I am. Uh, it's been a pretty rough go, but here we are. We're still with it. Let's keep going the rest of the way. So uh, before we do that, though, some announcements. Okay, so let's review what we talked about last time. So last week, the last lecture was on the Ankylosauria. So we were talking about the Thyreophora, the shield bearers, the big old armored dinosaurs. So we started with the Stegosauria, uh, and then we moved into the Ankylosauria, which included the Nodosauridae and the Ankylosauridae. So this dinosaur is a what? So take a look at this. Uh, animal here in all of its magnificence. Uh, what kind of dinosaur is this? So I'll give you a couple seconds. Look for the characteristics that you might use to identify it. Three, a two, a one, a zero. So this is an ankylosaurine. So this is an ankylosaur of some kind. I think this actually is ankylosaurus itself. Uh, how can you tell that it's not a nodosaur? Well, uh, the big giveaway is the big ball here at the end of the tail. So ankylosaurs, the more derived ankylosaurs, had tail clubs, and the nodosaurs didn't. And in some cases, they had stiffened tails, but they didn't have the tail clubs. Uh, not all ankylosaurines had the tail clubs either, but uh, the more derived forms did. So if you see the tail club ankylosaurine, uh, it's not a theropod. Theropods are the big bipedal dinosaurs. Well, they're not all big, but the bipedal, uh, generally carnivorous dinosaurs that we talked about last module when we were talking about the Sarisquian dinosaurs, which again, we talked about last module. All of the dinosaurs we're talking about this module are Ornithischians, uh, and this is no exception. All right, so uh, another thing that we've seen is the effect of plate tectonics and the effect of climate on dinosaur evolution and on dinosaur distribution. So thinking back to last week, uh, Ankylia, Ankylosauria are most likely uh, what in age and found on which continents. So I'll give you some time to look at that. <coughs> All right, so they're generally Cretaceous in age. So remember uh, the armored dinosaurs, uh, the Stegosauria, kind of the more uh, active defense with all the spikes, uh, they were uh, more prominent in the Jurassic. And there is very few, if any, examples from the Cretaceous. And that kind of flips around for the Ankylosauria, the big old armored passive defense dinosaurs uh, they are more prominent in the Cretaceous, and they're also really only found on the northern continents. So remember, in the Cretaceous, the late parts of the Mesozoic, the continents are coming apart. They're generally starting to look like the distribution that we know today. Uh, North America is rifting away from Europe and Africa. The North Atlantic is opening. South America and Africa are rifting apart as well. They're still pretty close here. Uh, maybe some exchange across here still. Uh, India, Madagascar have broken off, uh, beginning its journey towards Asia, where it will eventually hit, make the Himalaya mountains. You see here, Australia is still connected to Antarctica. It's eventually going to start its drift up to the north as well, uh, making some of the islands of Indonesia. Uh, so the ankylosaurids are only really from like Western North America, not even like Appalachia here, not a lot of dinosaurs from Appalachia, not a lot of the rocks preserved, unfortunately. So we've got a pretty poor record of Appalachian dinosaurs, but we know from New York, 
Uh, during the Triassic, we have the Coelophysis footprints, but, uh, and then over here in Asia, uh, ankylosaurids found very much, and I, there was a couple examples, scattered examples from Europe. Uh, at this time, Europe is essentially an archipelago. It's a series of little islands that are barely sticking up above the very high sea levels, flooding interiors of continents. Um, so keep that in mind. All right, so let's look at the Ornithischia cladogram. So where have we been? So Dinosauria as a whole, uh, we talked about Cerischia in Model 3, Module 3. <laughs> those, are, those are all the dinosaurs we talked about the last weeks before this. Uh, now we're talking about the Ornithischia. Uh, we've already gotten through uh, the basal Ornithischians. We've talked about the Thyreophora, the long shield bearers. Uh, now we're going to move up here into the Marginocephalia. Uh, we're going to start today with the Pachycephalosaurs, uh, and then we're going to talk about the Ceratopsia on Wednesday. Uh, and then the last class that's going to be devoted to these individual groups of dinosaurs. Friday, we're going to talk about the Ornithopoda, the bird foot dinosaurs, uh, that includes the hadrosaur duck-billed dinosaurs. Uh, and that's going to be that's going to be the end. So that's going to be the end of the individual dinosaurs. Uh, and then we're going to talk about um, going to talk about like dinosaur bearing formations and tie up some of the loose ends in the next one. So uh, let's talk about the marginal cephalia. So the marginal cephalia, marginal cephalia translates to ridged heads. Uh, and so cephalon is, is head and margin is, you know, the side. So they have these ridged heads. Uh, when you think about a triceratops or any of the ceratopsians, you think of that big old bony ridge sticking up off the back of the head, the bony frill. Uh, pachycephalosaurs have that too, but you see that it's a lot less dramatic. Uh, they don't really have that really big, bony, crusty frill, uh, but they do have ornamentation on the back of their heads, uh, and they have this kind of like friar cap looking uh, headwear here. Uh, so the two main groups here are the Pachycephalosauria, which are these, uh, the dome heads or head butters, sometimes they're called. Uh, they have a really thickened roof of their skull, and they have this arrangement of little small osteoderms uh, in some cases, full-on horns, kind of ringing the skull. Uh, the ceratopsia are the ones that we're probably a little bit more familiar with, where they have these large bony frills, these crests on the back, uh, and a varying number of horns on the face. So like uh, Styracosaurus goes insane with a lot of different horns. Uh, Triceratops has, hmm, how many horns does Triceratops have? <laughs> Three. Uh, so. Uh, there we go. So that's the marginocephalia. Uh, let's zoom in here on uh, the marginocephalia themselves. So uh, we're going to talk about ornithopoda next week, or, or sorry, on Friday. Uh, next class, Wednesday, we're going to walk up this group here, the ceratopsia. But for today, we're going to focus on the marginocephalia. And you'll notice that there's only two examples used here. Uh, there's not very many dinosaurs in this group, but again, they're characteristic of these thickened skull dome and also small ossifications along the ridge of the skull. So these osteoderms, or again, in some cases, horns kind of ringing that bony dome. So uh, Pachycephalosauria as a group, uh, it translates to thick-headed lizards. Uh, they're named that because they have those extraordinarily thickened skull domes, which we'll see in a second, some examples. Uh, and there's always th this debate about what the purpose was of that skull dome. So thinking back to the functional morphology lecture, where like form follows function, uh, the form is a big, thickened, bony skull. Uh, the function, what's the function? Why would you need a big, thickened, bony skull? Well, if we look at modern animals that have big, thick, bony skulls, like, say, musk oxen or uh, mountain goats, uh, big horn sheep, uh, they use it for headbutting. So present is the key to the past. If we see animals with thickened heads headbutting and jousting with their horns, uh, if we see that in the past, they probably did that too. Uh, there's a lot of debate about that, though. One of the reasons is that 
uh, unlike a lot of the other groups that we've seen before, uh, pachycephalosaurs in general have a really poor, fairly limited fossil record. And it's mostly just uh, pieces of those skull caps. So those skull caps are really big, thickened bone, and it preserves pretty well. Uh, but the rest of the dinosaur generally doesn't. And so it's not so much a function of these dinosaurs being rare, although they might not have been super common. Uh, it's probably a commentary on where they live. So remember that the fossil record is sort of biased towards certain environments. Uh, if, you're, if a dinosaur is walking along like a coastline where there's lots of sediment, lots of sand, lots of mud, or in a river, a floodplain, lots of sediment around there, uh, if they die there, they're very likely to be covered quickly with sediment and very likely to be fossilized. Uh, these pachycephalosaurs apparently lived in like the dry interior of Asia uh, where it's terrestrial and there's not a lot of running water, there's not a lot of sedimentation, uh, not very likely to be preserved. Uh, and then in the North American specimens, they seem to be favoring kind of mountainous terrain like the one behind me. Again, uh, not a lot of deposition going on in mountainous areas. Uh, in general, the mountains are being eroded away. Uh, and so the bones that would be scattered in that process too, the dinosaur potential fossils would be eroded away also. Uh, and so we have a limited record of these, uh, at least partially because of the environment that they inhabit. Uh, we kind of saw that a little bit with the ankylosaurs, where the ankylosaurs have a fairly sparse fossil record because they too tended to live up kind of in the highlands where they were unlikely to be, or I should say less likely to be preserved. Uh, this group originated in Asia. So they originated on the Asian continent uh, and then they later migrated to North America. So uh, we see this trend later on in the ice age where large mammals cross across the Bering Land Bridge uh, and also uh, humans potentially crossed across that Bering Land Bridge as well when the sea levels were much lower because of the glaciation going on. Uh, this wasn't glacier related, uh, it was tectonic related. There was probably a tectonic land bridge there that was connecting those continents uh, and the dinosaurs that originated in Asia such as the pachycephalosaur moved over to North America across that land bridge. And eventually some of them actually even went back. And so there's kind of two records of that. So again, this is an example of plate tectonic shaping dinosaur evolution and dinosaur distribution. If North America and Asia were not connected, the dinosaurs couldn't make that trip. Uh, we don't see pachycephalosaurs in the Southern Gondwanan continents. They are not on South America. They're not in Africa, they're not in Ant Antarctica, they're not in Australia, they're not in India, they're not in Madagascar, they're not on the southern continents. We find them only in North America and Asia, potentially scattered here and there uh, in Europe, although I don't think we're going to talk about any examples today. So again, uh, think about that as we're, as we're talking about all these different dinosaurs. Uh, they're also uh, kind of locked in time. Uh, in the mid to late Cretaceous. So these are kind of late comers on the dinosaur scene. Uh, there's no confirmed pachycephalosaurs from the early Cretaceous and certainly not back into the Jurassic. So this group originates uh, fairly late in the Mesozoic. Uh, some of the more basal members, again, we can have that problem with assigning, like, is this actually a pachycephalosaur or not? Uh, especially when we're only dealing with bone fragments. So potentially there are earlier forms that are just misdiagnosed at the moment. But uh, regardless of that, these are later, uh, later derived forms. And so they don't arrive on the scene until mid to late Cretaceous when the continents are already drifted apart. And so they can't get onto the boats. <laughs> they can't get onto South America. They can't get on Africa. Those continents have already drifted away. Uh, and you see some kind of the different forms here. Uh, and kind of just like the like Stegosauria and Ankylosauria, there's not a ton of different body variation here. Uh, you, like obviously like the sizes change, but it's, it's just kind of variation on a general form, uh, this uh, dome headed form. So again, the biggest question about this group of dinosaurs 
is what they really use that dome for. Uh, you see here this example, uh, this is a, a skull fragment and you see how thick this is. This is a couple inches thick and that's actually uh, kind of thin for a pachycephalosaur skull. Remember pachycephalo means thick headed. So their skulls can be as much as nine inches thick, um, even a little bit thicker in some cases. Uh, our human skulls, about a quarter inch thick maybe, something along that lines, uh, relatively delicate. Uh, if you want to headbutt somebody, it's going to hurt. Uh, you're going to feel it. It's not a pleasant thing. That's why uh, dangerous activities, we tend to wear helmets and things because our heads are relatively fragile. And obviously your brain is somewhat important to functioning. Uh, so pachycephalosaur brains were also important for functioning. They certainly didn't want to be damaging their brains. Uh, so if they were butting heads like this, they needed protection. They needed like crumple zone kind of technology. Uh, if you look at a musk ox, uh, musk oxes are the kind of modern champions of head butting along with like big horn sheep. Uh, you see this big thickened horny projection here on the forehead that they use to just smash into each other directly. Uh, did pachycephalosaurs do that? So did pachycephalosaurs do kind of the full on running headbutt? Uh, or did they kind of just kind of joust with their heads a little bit and use those small little bony projections, those little osteoderms to kind of lock in and just kind of butt each other and kind of fight back and forth, uh, kind of more analogous to what we see with like uh, bison. So bison do not like ram their heads full on, they kind of butt heads and kind of jostle back and forth. Uh, deer kind of do the same thing where they kind of block antlers and just kind of jostle back and forth. They don't full on. Uh, so, uh, or were they using these heads for kind of smashing into the sides of each other? Were they flanking into each other and trying to butt into the sides? Uh, they appear to have had uh, stomach ribs, gastralia, which a lot of the ornithicians, the other ornithicians don't. So that uh, might support that they were maybe smashing each other in the sides and they needed a little bit more bony protection. Um, but again, there's a lot of different debate that goes on here. Uh, the dome itself is relatively smooth uh, and it's relatively um, kind of dome shaped. Uh, and so if they did smash head heads onto each other, they probably would have glanced off. And so those horns are probably more like, again, to offer some texture, offer some support for not just sliding off of each other. Uh, we'll see some examples of uh, possible evidence for e e these behaviors uh, in these pachycephalosaurs. All right, so let's look at some examples. So the first one we're going to talk about is uh, stenopelix. Uh, it translates to narrow pelvis uh, after the hip structure of the only specimen that we have, or one of the few specimens that we have. Uh, it's from the early Cretaceous of Germany. So uh, all the others I think that we're going to talk about are from uh, North America and Asia. This one is from Germany, or at least seemingly from Germany. Well, it's definitely from Germany, but is it a pachycephalosaur, I guess is the question. So the specimen lacks the skull, which makes it a little bit hard to tell if it's a pachycephalosaur, being as their characteristic is the thickened skull dome. This specimen doesn't have the skull, but its hip structure is similar to other pachycephalosaurs. And so occasionally it's lumped in here. But as we've seen before, some of these basal transitional members that have characteristics of the earlier, uh, more primitive ancestors. They also have some of the properties of the more derived uh, advanced uh, pr uh, progeny. So it can be a little bit problematic to assign them in a group and where do you draw the line? And I hope you've seen up to this point that remember these cladograms, these evolutionary relationships, these different groups of organisms, these buckets that we're putting these organisms in, uh, remember that they are artificial. Uh, and things that we draw as a very uh, hard line uh, in reality is probably more like a spectrum. And so it's very difficult to draw that line precisely. But I hope you've also seen the benefits of doing so because it helps us group them together based on their common traits it helps us see like one of these things is not like the other. 
and draw logical groups of these to help us look at them in a logical way. And I hope I've tried to structure the class in a logical way to follow along with that. And hopefully it's helped a little bit. Um, but is it a basal pachycephalosaur or is it a basal ceratopsian? So the marginocephalia includes the pachycephalosaurs and the ceratopsian. Which group does it fit in? Uh, you can see here sort of reflected this uncertainty in these two very different reconstructions. So here's a house cat for scale. So this thing's not large. Uh, you see it's a basal member, but it doesn't show up on the scenes until the Cretaceous. So uh, again, these things originate pretty late in Asia. Uh, this reconstruction here uh, looks a lot like uh, Cetacosaurus, which is a basal ceratopsian, which we mentioned briefly uh, earlier in the course. We're going to talk about more on Wednesday. So uh, this reconstruction is based more on the ceratopsian model. Uh, you can kind of see this uh, little primitive frill back here. Uh, you can see the beak. Uh, those are ceratopsian features in addition to the frill here along the back of the tail. Again, those are ceratopsian or basal ceratopsian features. Uh, this reconstruction here is kind of more based on the pachycephalosaur model. Uh, it doesn't have that extensive frill, and you see it has kind of more of a dome head, uh, and it doesn't have the, the beak. It has kind of the more of the premaxillary pre teeth, like we'll see uh, in the pachycephalosaurs. Uh, so we don't really know what it is, and it's known from fairly limited material. Uh, if it is a pachycephalosaur, though, it would be the only uh, early Cretaceous pachycephalosaur, uh, and it would also be the only one that's found in Europe. And so uh, is it really a pachycephalosaur? Uh, don't know. In fact, you see here it is assigned with ceratopsia, but we don't know. It's a very limited material, so it's problematic to assign these things on limited material, but we, we try. So uh, maybe we'll learn more about this. Uh, finding more specimens would definitely help because it's a very limited material to work with at the moment. Uh, next one we're going to talk about uh, goyocephaly translates to decorated head. Uh, and it's called decorated head because it has kind of this uh, ring, like almost like a crown of little bony knobs uh, along that crest on the back of the head. Uh, and it's known from the late Cretaceous of Mongolia. And uh, remember these things, these pachycephalosaurs, they're known for their thickened skulls. They're known for their big old dome heads. Uh, this one doesn't really have that. It's got the thickened skull, but it doesn't have the dome-shaped head. It's really got kind of more of like a flatter, almost like a wedge-shaped head. Uh, it doesn't yet have the dome. And so that's something that we see later on in the more derived forms of the pachycephalosaur. Uh, another thing that's interesting about this one is that if you look at the jaw here, uh, it's drawn with these kind of aggressive uh, incisor teeth. So it has heterodentition, which a lot of these other pachycephalores do as well. Uh, they've got these premaxillary teeth. Uh, this is a very uh, exaggerated example. So goyocephaly has uh, fairly large incisor-like teeth at the front. Uh, we'll, we will see premaxillary frontal teeth uh, on some of the other pachycephalosaurs that we're going to talk about. But this is kind of like this weird, like almost saber tooth like example is a little bit unique among the pachycephalosaurs. And so uh, we're talking about Ornithischian dinosaurs, the bird hipped dinosaurs. Uh, they're known for being uh, herbivores. Uh, this is an example where it's possible that these are omnivorous, so they might be insectivores to some degree or maybe even eating smaller reptiles on occasion. Uh, one thing we see in nature is that, you know, a lot of things that are usually herbivores, if the opportunity prevents, presents itself, uh, they'll become omnivorous uh, on an opportunity basis. And so that might be what we see here, but uh, there's not a lot of material. Uh, reconstructing behavior and diet is very difficult. And so we basically just don't know but there's hints here that this thing probably wasn't strictly herbivorous. Uh, the dentition here is a little bit odd for a strictly herbivorous diet. Uh, and again, you see the scale here, uh, you know, relatively small. That's kind of a trend we're going to see here. None of these get exceptionally large. Uh, next one we're going to talk about is uh, tylocephaly. 
and it translates to swollen head. Uh, I, I was meant to look up whether Tylenol, uh, the root word was like swollen, uh, but because you use that for headaches. So tylocephalae means swollen head, uh, obviously named for its unusually large dome, which you see here in the reconstruction, uh, is known from the late Cretaceous of Mongolia. So again, these things originated in Asia and later migrated to North America. Interesting thing about tylocephaly is that it has the tallest known uh, skull dome. So again, this is one of the big features of pachycephalosaurs is this exaggerated skull dome. Uh, these are the kings of the exaggerated skull dome. The ratio here is the largest of the pachycephalosaurs. Uh, it's a pretty small form, so it's not the thickest skull in number of inches, but as far as ratios go, it's got the most domed of the heads. <clears throat> Uh, it's not known from very much material, though, uh, because, again, it likely lived in the dry, arid interior regions of Asia, uh, fairly similar to the dry, arid interior regions of Asia today. Uh, it lived in that environment that was very unlikely for it to be preserved, and so fossil material is pretty sparse, pretty scattered, and it's mostly skull fragments, this particularly fragments of the really thickened skull dome. Most pachycephalosaurs are known from only skull parts and in some cases mostly just skull uh, dome fragments. Uh, it also shared its environment with the larger uh, prenocephaly, which we're going to talk about on the next slide, uh, and it's possible that they're the same dinosaur. It's possible that it's a synonym, uh, and again this is something that we see a lot with these pachycephalosaurs where there's not a lot of material preserved. We don't really know a ton about them, and so there's a lot of uh, pachycephalosaurs that some authors group together and some split apart. Uh, and so this might be an example where it really should be the same dinosaur. So uh, although it does look uh, fairly different, uh, but is that a growth stage kind of thing? Uh, so this is prenocephale. Uh, it means sloping head. Uh, it's kind of named for the shape of its forehead. Uh, and it's again from the late Cretaceous of Mongolia. So it very similar time and environment to the previous. Uh, again, it's known only from the skull and assorted uh, limb fragments. So the fossil material for these pachycephalosaurs is pretty limited, probably because it's living in high upland mountainous areas, high upland forests, desert interior, uh, unlikely to be preserved in the fossil record. Uh, if you look at the teeth here, uh, these are uh, pretty clearly herbivorous teeth uh, throughout most of the jaw, uh, but it does have some of those premaxillary teeth on the front. Uh, so again, uh, possibly an omnivore. You see this a little bit larger than some of these, but still certainly not huge. Uh, and then we talk about Stegosaurus. So uh, Stegosaurus, so Stegosaurus was roofed lizard. Stegosaurus is roofed horn, so Sarasaur, Ceratosaur, remember the horned dinosaurs, uh, Rhinoceros, the nose horn, Stegosaurus means roof horn, uh, due to the horn-like knobs that kind of surround uh, the bony skull dome. Uh, it's known from late Cretaceous dinosaur park formation, so this is one of those North American pachycephalosaurs that migrated across from Asia. Uh, and Stegosaurus forms the basis for uh, most studies of uh, the pachycephalosaurus skull and its behavior. There is more material for this one than some of the others. Uh, and uh, kind of looking at the function, the form of the skull, and trying to infer the function of the skull, uh, it probably wasn't used to defend against predators. Uh, because the knobs and the ornation, the ornaments are generally along the side. And so if, if you're using it for defense, you'd probably have, first of all, it'd probably be pointier. Uh, and second of all, the defense would probably be up on the top. So you could actually like hit with the head and, and kind of stab with the head. So think about like triceratops or a bull, like that if you're going to use your horns for defense, uh, if you're going to use your bony head for defense, it should be kind of pointed forward. Uh, so again, the interpretation for this uh, is that it was more likely uh, for interspecies uh, kind of jostling. 
So maybe like uh, earning mates or impressing females or just generally display or recognizing one species from another based on the differences in the ornamentation. Uh, were they do were they used for straight on head butting collision? Uh, I tend to side with the party that says no, uh, because uh, the, the the geometry of the neck, uh, it, the necks don't really align right directly behind the skull. It kind of has like a little S curve. Uh, there's also not like massive musculature in the neck. So like think about like a bison, they have massive muscles in the neck and head. They actually have extensions on the spine that stick up to anchor those big muscles to support the headbutting lifestyle. Uh, don't really see that uh, in pachycephalosaurus. Again, we have fairly limited material though, so uh, maybe, maybe not. Um, the other thing is that these heads are kind of dome shaped, uh, kind of think about like football helmets. Uh, when two football helmets kind of collide, they kind of glance off of each other. Uh, and it's also a really small impact area. So all of the force of that impact is generated on the leading edge of that dome, and it would transfer to the leading edge of that other dome. Uh, and some of the modeling suggests that they would just shatter each other's skulls, and the first time that they butted heads would be the last time they butted heads, because both of them would be knocked out uh, with concussions or worse. So uh, more likely, uh, it's probably more for like jostling, where they kind of lock heads and sort of push against each other, uh, rather than the full-on headbutting, uh, or again, more smashing into the softer sides, uh, just because it, the, 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 the dome's not really designed for kind of high speed, high velocity, high force impacts, uh, or at least not apparently. Uh, it, it, it doesn't have, they don't have a lot of the same adaptations that the modern like ramming animals do. So they, they probably didn't, but that's still a very active debate, <laughs> uh, and uh, I, I, I won't wait in any further on that. Uh, the next one we're going to talk about is uh, Gravitholus. So that translates to heavy dome, uh, again, for obvious reasons. Uh, I hope you're starting to see the trend here where uh, the names for these dinosaurs isn't really all that creative. <laughs> uh, it's just some, some trend on big dome, thick dome, heavy dome. <laughs> Big, big skull. Um, so they're found in the late Cretaceous dinosaur park formation of Alberta, and it's possibly synonymous with Stegosaurus, the one that we talked about on the last slide. So relatively limited material, uh, very difficult to say definitively whether it's a different species or not. Uh, and so it possibly is a, a synonym of Stegosaurus. Uh, if it wasn't a synonym for Stegosaurus, why is it present in the same environment as Stegosaurus is? So uh, if this isn't the same pachycephalosaur, uh, that means that there's multi, multiple pachycephalosaurs present at the same time in the same place. And that's something that we don't usually see with the dinosaurs. There's usually only a handful of them occupying the same or similar niches. Uh, like with sauropods, we saw the niche differentiation with the big high browsers, the medium browsers, and the low browsers. Uh, so yeah, there were multiple sauropods present, but they were doing different things. Uh, is that maybe what was happening here where there were different pachycephalosaurs present, but they were filling different roles? Maybe one was slightly larger uh, medium browser. You see uh, Grapatholus is you know, getting fairly large-ish. There's the cat for scale. Uh, and then another interesting thing about uh, Gravitholus is uh, this is one of the specimens. Uh, you see on the skull cap here, there are these uh, marks, these uh, lesions. Uh, these are erosional lesions where there was probably some kind of uh, skin infection, some infection uh, that got into the bone and it actually deteriorated the bone. And so this is actually evidence that, uh, yeah, maybe the skull caps aren't that great for headbutting, but maybe that didn't necessarily stop them. Uh, and so we do see wounding uh, in the skull caps that might correspond to these 
but that could also just be from jostling. Uh, so I guess I'm not really sure uh, where I land on this, but uh, I tend to think that they weren't full on smashing heads into each other. Uh, next one, uh, Spherotholus. Uh, ball dome uh, in reference to the dome skull. Uh, and again, this is from the latest Cretaceous of Western North America. So if we look at the Hell Creek formation, uh, Hell Creek, we've mentioned Hell Creek formation before. Uh, Tyrannosaurus rex is from the Hell Creek formation. Triceratops is present in the Hell Creek formation. Uh, why are there four different Pachycephalosaurus present in the Hell Creek formation? Uh, well, maybe there's not. Maybe they're all the same Pachycephalosaurus uh, at different stages of its life. Uh, we'll see on the next slide, we're going to talk about Dracorex, and then we're going to talk about Pachycephalosaurus, those, and along with uh, Stigmolek, those probably actually are the same uh, Pachycephalosaur. Uh, Spherolotholus is probably something different, though. Uh, one thing that's unique about this one is that it has an unusually long duration. It was around for about 8 million years. That's a really good long run for a dinosaur uh, as, a, as a species. Uh, it also has a very large range, so it goes pretty much all of North Western North America, all of uh, Laramidia, so pretty much all Western Canada, down through Western United States, all the way down into like Western Mexico. Uh, but yeah, it's found in the Hell Creek Formation along with Pachycephalosaurus, so uh, why were they both present in the same formation at the same time? Uh, were they filling the same roles or was there something different about their roles? Uh, in the reconstruction here, uh, this reconstruction you see it's reconstructed with feathers. Uh, you also see that they've uh, made the skull dome a little bit more like ornamental. Uh, again, if these things were for display and uh, sexual selection, uh, they probably were a little bit more ornamented, a little bit more brightly colored. Uh, if you're trying to show off, it's probably going to be a little flashier. Uh, and, and if it's more for like uh, jostling and jousting, uh, maybe it's a little bit uh, less flashy. Uh, you also see that this is uh, no feathers whatsoever on this. There's no evidence of feathers in the pachycephalosaurs but there is evidence of feathers in some of the more basal ornithischians. And so it's always this question of like, how far up the tree do we want to push that? So because we found feathers in the ancestors of these dinosaurs, does that mean that they had feathers? Uh, we don't see any evidence of it, direct evidence, but uh, again, we'll have to wait for better preserved material. Uh, in general, we're just working from fragments of the skull if they had feathers, it's extraordinarily unlikely that they would be preserved in that environment where not even bone is really being preserved all that well. The skeletons are broken up, they're fragmented, only the really robust bones of the skull dome are generally preserved. Uh, so uh, let's talk about Draco Rex, which is a really cool name. Uh, Draco Rex translates to Dragon King uh, because it, it I mean, it looks like a dragon, right? It's a pretty cool, it looks like a fantasy dragon. Uh, it's known from the latest Hell Creek formation, uh, just like the previous example. Uh, its species name is Hogwartsia, which uh, is to honor Harry Potter. So Draco Rex Hogwartsia, the dragon king of Hogwarts. Uh, uh, one thing that's interesting about it is that it doesn't really have the dome skull. Uh, but instead it has these very prominent horns. Uh, and so initially it was like its own thing. It was its own species, its own genus. Uh, but now uh, it's probably, it's generally grouped in with uh, Pachycephalosaurus and that this is a juvenile Pachycephalosaurus. And so uh, you'll notice that it's, well, you'll see that it's smaller than Pachycephalosaurus. Uh, and probably like throughout its growth, uh, the dome develops over time. And so these horns would be sort of marginalized uh, and uh, they probably don't stop, they, they probably stay this size, but the dome grows. And so the horns become kind of less significant and the dome becomes more prominent uh, as it develops over time. So again, think of all the different changes that happens to the geometries of a human as we grow up. Uh, 
uh, things happen to these dinosaurs as they grow too. And so the morphology of the skull might change as it grows up from juvenile to adolescent to adult. It's very difficult to recognize that in the fossil record and very often they're lumped in as, or, they're, or rather I should say they're separated out as separate species. Uh, this is a case where it probably is the same species at different stages of its development. Uh, and so uh, again, we see also that the premaxillary teeth are gone and we have kind of a, a beak there at the front. <clears throat> uh, and then this is the last one that we're gonna talk about, Pachycephalosaurus, which is obviously the uh, namesake for the group, translates to thick-headed lizard, as we said before, because of the thick bony dome. <laughs> obviously, uh, you've got that point already. Uh, it's from the latest Cretaceous of Western North America, the Hell Creek Formation, Western US, uh, but also up into Alberta. It's also the largest uh, and the last of the pachycephalosaurs. So this thing made it all the way to the asteroid impact. This was around at the end of the age of the dinosaurs, uh, as all the Hell Creek dinosaurs are. Uh, it saw the asteroid coming down out of the sky, like, oh. <laughs> um, but again, it's only known from one skull and a bunch of bits of the dome. And <clears throat> again, here's the uh, pachycephalosaurs of the Hell Creek Formation. Why are there four different pachycephalosaurs in the Hell Creek Formation? Well, uh, Dracorex is probably a juvenile, uh, Stigmolic probably an adolescent, and then pachycephalosaurus, the full-grown adult, uh, and Spherotholus probably does represent an actual different dinosaur. Uh, and you can see that this thing is, uh, it's the largest pachycephalosaur, and it, it's not huge. Uh, it's, you know, a little bit taller than a human maybe at the hip. Uh, in a very large specimen. So uh, that's pachycephalosaurus. Uh, really not a whole lot more to say. They're not a very diverse group and they're not very well known. Not a lot of material. So uh, I hope you enjoyed that. I hope you see some of the limits of the fossil record and I will see you next time. Goodbye.